What's up traders and welcome to another installment of the Market Bear Metrics Fundamental Analysis Series. I'm your host Neil and in today's video we're going to be talking about the metrics related to growth. Now again these numbers are going to be pulled from the financial statements and specifically we're going to be looking at revenue, net income, free cash flow, EBITDA, earnings per share, dividends per share, and market cap, all in an attempt to measure company growth. Not only is it important to understand whether a company is growing, but it's important to understand the trend in that growth and in what way a company is growing. For example, is a company growing its sales? Is a company growing its profits? Is a company growing sales but not profits? Or not growing sales but growing profits? Additionally, is a company generating free cash flow? And is it redistributing? its profits to its shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. Answering these types of questions helps lend to our understanding of the key factors driving company performance and by extension share price. And when we use this information in conjunction with the analysis that we've already done as far as valuation, solvency, and profitability, we can develop a deep understanding of these companies, a narrative that helps us identify the most attractive investment opportunities and make smarter investment decisions. So without further ado, let's jump in and learn a little bit more about the metrics associated with company growth. All right, team growth metrics. Now, again, these are designed to look at the growth trends associated with the company and is going to consider things like sales, the various levels of profit and the amount of free cash flow that a company is generating and redistributing to shareholders. Now, these, for the most part, are not financial ratios, save for earnings per share and dividends per share. So basically, we're just looking at different numbers from the income statement and statement of cash flows. And we're going to be looking at the trend of those things through time. What we generally we want to see is steady growth, telling us that a company is reinvesting in itself and is doing what it can to grow sales and to grow profit along with those sales to generate earnings and free cash flow. We want to find those companies that are creating value and growth, the growth rate and the future growth of a company are a few of the factors that contribute to value and that can potentially drive share price higher. All right. So behind me here, we have all the definitions of the various measures of growth that we're going to be looking at. Again, you can download all the notes that we've used in these videos here for free over at marketbarometrics.com. But again, I wouldn't just expect you to read these definitions and memorize what each of them means. It's going to be a lot easier to internalize this stuff if we put it in the context of where these numbers come from, what they mean, how they're derived, right? So we'll start with market cap here. But for the most part, we're going to spend the rest of the video in the financial statements talking about where the rest of these metrics come from. So market cap. Market cap is one measure of company value and it's the theoretical price one would pay to acquire the entire company given the current share price. It takes share price and multiplies it by shares outstanding. Now, I personally don't really use market cap as part of my growth analysis. I mostly just use it as a reference for, you know, what's the rough size of a company relative to its competitors, right? As a measure of growth, it's not very dependable because share price fluctuates so much and because a company is able to do things like offer more shares or buy buy back shares changing the shares outstanding portion of this metric and that can distort the trend in market cap and the efficacy of using market cap as a measure of the growth rate of a company. To that end, earnings per share and dividends per share are also not as reliable as measures of growth, which is funny because they're so often cited as important metrics. But you know, the shares outstanding portion of those ratios is susceptible to manipulation, right? If a company is buying back shares aggressively, that's going to artificially inflate their earnings per share number. So maybe they're not actually growing their earnings, but they're growing their earnings per share because they're buying back shares. So there's less shares outstanding. So so you can't really utilize earnings per share or dividends per share as a measure of growth unless you put it in the context of the shares outstanding. And if you look at the summary page of the fundamental analysis section of the market barometer, that's actually exactly how that's set up. The two charts on the bottom of the growth column on the far right show earnings per share and shares outstanding and their trend through time so that you can evaluate earnings per share in the context of shares outstanding. And with applied materials here, you can see that we have 
have a perfect demonstration of that. The bottom chart is showing shares outstanding, trending down through time, telling us that Applied Materials has been aggressively buying back shares. At the same time, earnings per share has gone up. So while they might be growing their earnings, there's also less shares outstanding. So we can't really trust that earnings per share figure moving up and to the right, because at least some portion of that has to do with the fact that there's less shares outstanding. And by extension, you know, share price itself isn't necessarily the best indicator of company growth because you know share price is just a factor of supply and demand. It tells us what investors are willing to buy and sell shares of the company for. So that might not have anything to do with the company actually growing. Maybe it's just the perceived value that the company has. But what we're talking about here is actual measures of growth. I'm interested in the unequivocal measures of growth. I'm talking about revenue growth and you know free cash flow growth in particular. Also, EBITDA and net income are much less susceptible to you know distortions as market cap and share price and earnings per share, dividend per share, that sort of thing. So for those of you that are watching this video out of order and are still unfamiliar with the financial statements and the income statement in particular, let's jump in there real quick and get some background on revenue, EBITDA, and net income. So revenue is synonymous with sales, right? It's the top line of the income statement, and it's gonna tell us the dollar amount that a company generated in sales over a given time frame. So as far as growth is concerned, this is one of the main numbers that we want to look at. We want to see revenue growing, and ideally we'd like to see it growing at a relatively consistent rate. Next we have EBITDA. Now EBITDA is a level of profitability that says you know, what percentage of sales is being converted into profit after deducting both the direct and indirect costs of producing the goods or services that generated the revenue, that generated the sales, right? So this is a supportive number to sales growth, and it helps us get a different Different perspective on growth and when you put these things together it helps you develop a better understanding of growth for example if a company is growing its revenue but it's not growing its EBITDA that might tell you that they're you know increasing their sales but that they're not able to convert those increased sales into increased profit so even though they're growing their sales it doesn't mean that the company has more value because at the end of the day it's profit that's going to translate into value for shareholders so you want to not only see revenue growth but you'd also like to see EBITDA growth and to that end you'd also want to see net income growth so net income is the most granular level of profit it's the profit that's left over after accounting for all the costs and expenses associated with the ongoing business operations of a company it's synonymous with earnings now net income or earnings is obviously a big deal you know it's straight up an event anytime a company releases earnings and the fact that the financial pundits say releasing earnings is indicative of how much focus is on net income because a company doesn't release earnings it releases its financial statements and the bottom line of this one financial statement is earnings right net income so net income is a big deal and you know you're gonna want to see a healthy growth rate in net income that said and a small disclaimer is that net income just like to some degree every metric we look at is susceptible to distortions. These financial statements are subject to the rules and regulations of generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, right? And while this is not a video series on accounting and accounting techniques, just know that there are ways that accountants can massage the net income figures. They know that a ton of financial analysts and investors are scrutinizing net income and its growth rate. So these companies, accountants and lawyers are gonna do everything that they can do to make net income look as favorable as possible. That said, there's really only so much that they can do and at the end of the day, if net income is trending down over the long term, they're not gonna be able to make it look like it's trending up over the long term. But that's one of the main reasons that we look at so many different financial ratios because we wanna get as many perspectives on these numbers as possible. Because having different perspectives, looking at these things from different angles helps us see through any accounting distortions. And with all of that in mind, we have our last measure of growth, which is free cash flow growth. Now, free cash flow is derived from the statement of cash flows. It takes the operating cash flow figure from this financial statement and subtracts from it any expenses for capital expenditures. So free cash flow growth and revenue growth are the two growth figures that I rely on most because they're the least susceptible to accounting distortions. It's pretty hard to fake free 
cash flow growth. And whenever a company is consistently growing its free cash flow, there's going to be more money available to redistribute to shareholders through dividends and through share buybacks. So growing free cash flow is always a good thing. So before we jump into the market barometer and start interpreting these things, you'll notice I skipped over dividends per share and that was intentional because I generally don't think of dividends per share as a good measure of growth in the way that I might revenue or free cash flow. But dividends per share is an important number, especially for those of you investing specifically in dividend stocks, right? And having an idea of the size of the dividend that a company is distributing to its shareholders can also be an important factor. So that's why we included it in the software. But just know that as with earnings per share, dividends per share is susceptible to you know distortions because of the per share part because the shares outstanding can fluctuate through time and a company can you know buy back shares or issue new shares so if you're looking to find companies that are growing their dividend make sure that you're considering the dividends per share ratio in the context of the shares outstanding so here we are in the market barometer. I'll give you guys a brief rundown in case you're watching this video out of order as to you know what we're looking at here and how the software functions. On the left, you get this bank of buttons. It's gonna give you access to you know the financial ratios, in this case associated with growth. Uh, so selecting any of these buttons is gonna update the charts and figures to the right. In the top left, you get a ticker selection. You're gonna get the company name in the top middle and you get that company's sector and industry in the top right. These four charts here are going to give you that financial ratio trending through time for the individual company you have selected up here in yellow. Below that is going to be the industry median. Below that is the entire sector median. And below that is the entire market median and their trends through time. So applied materials is in the semiconductors industry and it's in the technology sector. And our database here tracks about 2,200 different U.S publicly traded companies. The figures to the left of the charts are the year to date average of the financial ratio you have selected. And if you wanna learn more about how the software functions or how these things are calculated, why we've included these numbers in the way that we have, and you know how to manipulate these charts in different ways, check out some of our software specific tutorial videos over at marketbarometrics.com. So let's begin by taking a look at revenue growth. I've selected the revenue button down here and it's updated all the charts to the right. Uh, this yellow chart here, again, is the individual company that we're looking at, Applied Materials in this case. And at a glance, it looks like revenue has generally trended up and to the right over the last five years or so. But it looks like revenue peaked in 2018 and has since then tapered off a little bit. And that's interesting, especially when you consider it relative to the industry median right below it here. Um, you know, it looks like Applied Materials had a pretty bad 2019, while the semiconductor sector in general enjoyed a pretty good 2019. So you can see Applied Materials kind of deviating from the industry median during 2019. So I'd be curious as to why that was, and if that's anything that's gonna raise a red flag as to future potential revenue growth. That said, so far in 2020, it looks like Applied Materials has started to move back up again and resume its upward trend as far as revenue is concerned. While at the same time, the semiconductors industry has mostly stayed the same and actually so far in 2020 is not doing as well. And that makes sense given that, you know, we had the COVID-19 pandemic fallout earlier this year. So generally, I'm not shocked to see the semiconductors industry moving down thus far into 2020. Um, but it looks like applied materials outperformed the semiconductors industry through the COVID-19 pandemic fallout. So that's interesting to note. It makes me less nervous about the poor revenue that they generated in 2019. Below that, we can compare it to the sector, in this case, the technology sector, right? And again, the year-to-date averages aren't gonna make as much sense to use when we're measuring growth because companies of different sizes, of different market caps and enterprise values are gonna have substantially different revenue. News. And we're not necessarily as concerned with the absolute value of these growth metrics as so much as we're concerned with the trend in these metrics. So in general, the technology sector has basically just moved up and to the right, has trended upwards over this time frame, the last several years. And for the most part, the entire market has too. So things to keep in the back of our mind as we continue our evaluation of growth. So I like to start my growth analysis with revenue to establish, you know, is this company growing sales? 
What we've determined is that for the most part over the last five years, the trend in applied materials revenue is generally up. Although since 2018, it started to trend down a little bit. So we'll wanna keep those things in mind as we go on to analyze the profit growth through the net income and EBITDA figures. We'll wanna look for inconsistencies in the growth in their profit at the net income and EBITDA levels relative to their revenue growth. So the first level of profit below revenue on the income statement is EBITDA. So let's look in to EBITDA growth next. Selecting the EBITDA button here uh, updates my charts on the right. And we see that in general, EBITDA has trended the same way as revenue, where it's mostly up over this time frame, but peaked in 2018 and began tapering off since then. Notably is that, you know, between 2019 and 2020, as far as revenue growth, revenues were back up. Whereas here, we're seeing that EBITDA has yet to recover from this shorter term downtrend. So a slight divergence from the growth trend as far as revenue is concerned here at the EBITDA level of profit, but nothing that really raises too much concern yet. The next level of profitability on the income statement is net income. So let's take a look at that. Selecting the net income button here updates the charts on the right. And so again, this is pretty similar where in general net income is growing as revenue and EBITDA had. But I am seeing a slight difference here where in this case net income peaked in 2017. Uh, which was earlier than revenue and EBITDA and trended down in 2018 and 2019 as revenue and EBITDA had. But along with revenue, net income has enjoyed a move back up here so far in 2020. But what's really jumping out at me here is the fact that applied materials and the semiconductor industry have both really outperformed the technology sector and the market as a whole as far as net income is concerned over the last two years. So that tells me that, you know, applied materials in the semiconductors industry are fairly attractive relative to the technology sector and the market in general. Now, why would that be? Uh, that has to do with, you know, macroeconomic movements. And generally, I'd say that probably has a lot to do with the COVID-19 pandemic fallout earlier this year. Um, you know, it would seem that the semiconductors industry caught a tailwind from, you know, changing consumer spending and behavior patterns. Lastly, let's look at free cash flow low growth and see if that gives us any more information. And really, it would seem that free cash flow has grown pretty much in lockstep with revenue, net income, and EBITDA, where you know it peaked in 2018, had a rough 2019, and has picked back up slightly in 2020. So it looks like Applied Materials is on course to resume its upward growth trend uh, as far as revenue, EBITDA, net income, and free cash flow are concerned. But if I was looking at making a long-term investment in Applied Materials, this is definitely something I would want to monitor. I would want to ensure that over the next several quarters, revenue, EBITDA, net income, and free cash flow decisively resume their upward growth trend. And again, we're really not going to dive into dividends per share, earnings per share, or market cap as part of our company growth analysis here. But just know that you do have access to them through the market barometer here on the growth page because they are growth related and they are important numbers that are useful to certain traders in certain situations. There you have it, folks. A deep dive look into the metrics associated with measuring the growth of a company. We talk specifically about revenue, EBITDA, net income, and free cash flow growth, and also touched on market cap, earnings per share, and dividends per share. Understanding a company's growth and the trend in their growth helps us understand one more facet of company performance and can indicate to us how a company is likely to perform into the future. We can use the market barometer to evaluate the trend in the different growth metrics and to compare compare and contrast that to industry, sector, and market averages. This is an important piece of developing our understanding of what these numbers are telling us and what that means for a company's value. So if you guys like this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, comments down below, and until next time, we'll see you guys in the next video.